So hi everyone, welcome to today's uh, noon talk. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Brandon Zia. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, Brandon is a professor of uh, bioengineering at McGill, where he holds a tier two Canada research chair in computational and system biology. He graduated from Peking University with a BS in chemistry, a major and a minor in computer science. Uh, he received his PhD in chemistry from Stanford specializing in uh, computational structural biology uh, under the supervision of uh, Michael Levitt and carried out postdoctoral research in bioinformatics with Mark Gernstein at uh, Yale University. And before joining McGill in 2013, he was an assistant professor of bioinformatics and chemistry at Boston University. His research uses computational and uh, data science to probe design principles of proteins and protein networks in health and disease. And uh, I thought it was quite interesting what Brandon was working on. And I'm personally interested uh, because of what we're doing with um, modeling of uh, DNA. And I think uh, since that's happening in many groups at, uh, at, uh, in medical physics that uh, Brandon's work would be of interest to us. So uh, welcome, Brandon, and uh, we we'll look forward to your talk on multi-scale modeling of biomolecular networks. Thanks. Yeah, you can take your okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, John, for the invitation and for the really nice introduction. So, as John mentioned, um, I'm a, a computational uh, and data scientist in the bioengineering department. Uh, uh, which sits in the Faculty of Engineering at, at McGill. So uh, you may wonder, you know, what is a computational data scientist do in the bioengineering department and how is it really medical physics? And for one, I think both bioengineering departments and the medical physics unit ha has very strong uh, ties with the graduate program in biological biomedical engineering. So we, we are part of this very broad and a very exciting spectrum of activities, right, at McGill, uh, with, 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 with that, that works at this interface of life science, medicine, and engineering. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and share uh, what I work on and uh, with, uh, with all of you. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is multi-scale modeling of uh, molecular networks. Uh, how do I get this thing? Oh, here we go. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, uh, interest currently on this uh, topic of uh, systems biology and network biology. So what is it all about? So here I'm showing you a picture, a hairball of the so-called human protein interactome. So as all of we know, uh, as all of you know, human ha has uh, the, the human genome encodes about 20,000 genes. If you assume that each one of these coding regions encodes one protein, then it has uh, about 20,000 proteins. So each one of these dots in this graph represents a protein, a, a human protein and then each one of those, these connections represents a precise physical interaction between two different human proteins okay so um and then what you end up having uh, so this is a major undertaking right now to map the so-called human protein interactome uh, by experiments uh, so this is done uh, by many labs in the world what i'm showing you here is uh, the interactome produced by uh mark Vidal and colleagues uh, at uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard Medical School. But there are many uh, activities, current activities on mapping the human protein right Now, the reason why everybody's so excited about this is because this is really the first step in terms of producing a model of the cell, if you wish, right? I mean, we typically think of the cell, everybody knows the cell is more than just a bag of chemicals. So if you really want to have a model of the cell that is going to be useful and predictive, it's going to uh, necessarily have to include all the parts list. We're, we're, we're going to have to know what's in the cell, all the molecules in the cell, including proteins and other molecules, DNA and other molecules, but also how they interact with each other uh, to generate uh, its function, right? So the uh, these network these interactive networks represents really the first step towards building a model of the cell that is going to be useful. Uh, of course, this is still far from a good model of the cell. You still have to fill in all the missing details, uh, but this is a, a good, important first step. Now, uh, where I come in is, uh, well, you know, I'm a computational biologist who is very interested in molecular structure, uh, three-dimensional structure um, uh, of proteins, protein modeling. So even though uh, these, these uh, network biology um, uh, wire diagrams are very useful, but still, I mean, all you know is that here are two proteins that interact, but what you don't know is 
how do they interact? You just need oil, oil noise, the two proteins that talk to each other. You don't know which uh, amino acid site mediates those interactions, and you don't know what kind of impact a particular mutation is going to have or any sort of uh, pathogenic perturbations is going to have on that particular protein-protein interaction. Okay, so that, that is the challenge uh, that we currently have. And where I come in is, I would like to argue that one way of um, addressing that issue is by filling in the missing details. So for example, here, uh, each one of these proteins, uh, which is represented as a node in this interactive network, what we'll, we would be able to, uh, like to be able to do is to build an atomic structural model for that protein, okay? As well as for each one of these edges, protein-protein interactions, we would like to be able to build a molecular model, structural model for the protein-protein uh, uh, protein interaction. So here, showing you here to the right is a, 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 a atomic uh, picture, a model for that specific protein-protein interaction to the left. So why is this? Uh, so this is a so-called structural systems biology, and uh, but why is this uh, important? I would like to argue that this is important because if you think about it, um, the, the only way to make your model of the cell to be a, a useful predictive model is for it to be able to link co causes to consequences, right? So, I mean that's the only way to make a model useful. So if we think about it, a lot of the causes in biology and in medicine are tiny changes, right? For example, point mutations, tiny, tiny changes at the atomic level could uh, cause a single missense mutation on the protein sequence. But then that, that tiny cause gets blown up out of proportion, generates a big consequences. The whole cell dies, you have cancer, you know, and then you got, you got sick and so on and so forth. So, uh, it seems to me like the only way to be able to link these causes and consequences, which happen at very different levels, is to, is to have a model of the cell which, in, which has those two levels, at least two levels. So that's what I mean by multi-scale has two different scales. Uh, so it needs to have include at least the scale of the causes, which is the atomic scale, as well as the scale of the consequences, which is the network scale, you know, how these tiny little atomic changes gets blown up, affects the whole networks and causes changes of organismal phenotype, you know, either be deleterious or, or whatnot. Uh, so this is how I argue that this, this idea of structural systems biology really fills, fill, you know, fills in that need uh, and is particularly useful in terms of understanding uh, the, the link between the causes and consequences in uh, both biology and medicine. So the way we're going to do that, uh, how do we produce uh, atomic structural models for proteins and protein-protein interactions? We use a well-established um, method called homology modeling. And the basic idea is also called template-based modeling, which is fairly simple. So the way you do it is that there has been a lot of experiment, experimental structural biologists out there who have spent many, many years determining uh, three-dimensional structures of proteins. Now, you got a new protein of interest, you only know its sequence, you don't know its structure. How are you going to produce a molecular model for the structure? Easy. You take your protein, you search it through, let's say, the protein data bank, which is a collection of all the proteins uh, with experimental structures. And then uh, if you're lucky, uh, you'll get a hit. You're going to get a hit of your sequence to one of the uh, protein uh, uh, sequences with known structure. Uh, so they will look very similar to each other in terms of sequence similarity, and in which case you're going to say, okay, if they look similar in terms of sequence, they're going to look sim similar in, in terms of three-dimensional structure. So I can literally just borrow that structure from that uh, uh, the other protein and then use it to build a model for my protein. So that is called a homology modeling. So this actually turns out uh, you can do this about more than 50% of the time, which is pretty good. Uh, uh, you can also do the same thing to protein-protein interactions, okay? So here you have um, a, a pair of protein of interest. You know they interact. You know they interact by experimental determination, uh, either by these two hybrid or other 
or mass spectrometry or other methods, you know they interact experimentally, you know their sequences, but you don't know their structures. You want to build a molecular model for their structure. Same thing. Well, you take this pair of sequence, a protein sequence, you search it against the library of all the other protein complexes that has been determined experimentally, whose structure has been determined experimentally. If you're lucky, you're going to get a hit, a significant sequence similarity hit. So now we have this protein complex, which we already know the, uh, the structure whose sequences look similar to the sequences of my pair of interacting proteins. So in that case, I'm going to just borrow that uh, structure for the, this other protein complex and build a so-called homology model for my uh, query protein pair. So this is uh, sort of the, uh, an easy way, a standard way, a well-known way uh, to uh, fill in essentially the atomic, the missing atomic details, right? That, that is not there in the binary interactome that we start from. So from here we can, what we can do is we can take the, the binary protein interactome to the left and shown here, and uh, we can use this procedure to fill in the missing details of atomic details of where of which uh, residue size mediates uh, the interaction. Um, uh, of course, we can't do that for the entire uh, binary interactome. We can only do that for a subset, uh, you know, a small subset. But still, for that subset, we have all the atomic details and we can use it uh, to do a lot of different things. So in particular, what's shown down here is one of the early work that, um, uh, that we did, uh, Philip Kim, Jason Lu, and myself, when we were uh, postdocs at Mark Gerstein's lab. So we were able to show that by using this approach, you can actually be able to tell, let's say here's a hot protein, the green hot protein that interacts with many other uh, interaction partners, you can actually tell how exactly uh, does that, uh, how exactly does that hot protein mediate so many different interactions. So it turns out that there are two different mechanisms, two different types of hops. You see there's this uh, blue hub in which it uh, mediates all these other in, uh, uh, interactions using the same binding interface versus this yellow hub in which uh, this, uh, this hop protein mediates different interactions using different binding interfaces. So you can imagine that these are two very different, completely different type of uh, mechanisms. And this is only going to reveal itself if you have the atomic detail of your protein, protein interaction network. So I want to show you some more recent uh, 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 examples of, of, the, of the power of this approach, a structural systems biology approach or high resolution systems biology approach. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, genetic mutations, the impact, use it to understand the impact of genetic mutations on, uh, in, on uh, uh, biological networks, and then talk a little bit about um, how can use this approach to gain some insight into this, you know, the so-called design principles of biological networks. And finally, if we're at time, also touch upon how we can use this approach to gain some understanding of the infectious disease and how pathogens perturb, uh, disrupt uh, host interactome networks. Uh, so, uh, so one of the uh, very um, uh, sort of key insight into uh, this um, into the into this uh, field of um, uh, uh, systems biology, especially in relation to genetic disease, is this realization that mutations, especially missense mutations, right, point mutations, which causes a, 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 a change in one amino acid of a of a protein. Um, its effect on the interactome uh, network, on the whole interactome network, can be very subtle. It's very precise, but it's very subtle. So this is the concept of agiotype introduced by Mark Vidal and colleagues at the Inner Cancer Institute. So the basic idea is that each mutation has a kind of a signature, has a kind of a fingerprint uh, of, uh, of a precise uh, uh, disruption of the, interactome, uh, of the interactome network. So here we have a wild type uh, interactome configuration like here. So here we have a protein in the middle that interacts with two other proteins. It doesn't interact with the third protein. And then we have a mutation here, the mutation, this, the first mutation, sits on the surface of this middle hub protein, okay, but it's outside of all the, inter all the interfaces. So basically, you can, you can say, well, in this case, this looks like a pretty harmless mutation. It's probably not going to do anything. So this is called a quasi-wild type mutation because it doesn't, it doesn't change anything about the, 
about the network. Okay, so the the, the entire network is still the same. So this is uh, edge pres uh, uh, preservation. You preserve all the interaction edges. Now here we have a second mutation which sits in the core of the protein, inside in the core of the protein. And you can imagine what it's going to do. It's going to basically disrupt the whole protein. The whole protein falls apart. So the protein is gone. All the interaction that it mediates are gone as well. So this is called the quasi null uh, mutation because it leads to essentially a loss of a protein, a loss of a node in the network, uh, or, uh, together with all the interactions. But here, but it's more subtle than that. Here we have another situation. Here, here we have another mutation that's on the surface of the middle protein, uh, but it lies at the interface, at the interface that mediates a specific protein-protein interaction. So what's going to happen when you have this mutation is the protein is still there. The protein is still there. It's still largely functioning, but it loses a specific part of its function. In particular, it loses its interaction with this specific binding partner. So it's a very subtle and tiny, but very precise disruption of the function of the protein. Okay, so this one is the one that we're really interested in. This is called agetic, agetic mutation. It leads to a specific edge loss, but the protein is still there. The protein um, is still there and still carry on all of these other normal functions. Occasionally, you may also have this, for, this other situation, which is uh, quite interesting. You may have a mutation which leads to a gain of edge, a gain of a protein-protein interaction. Suddenly, you form a new protein-protein interaction, which was not there. And you can imagine that this could also cause a lot of different kinds of troubles. Uh, so these different mutation agiotypes, they can be uh, both measured experimentally, and people use things like ES2 hybrid screens or other experimental screens. You can actually measure the precise impact of different point mutations, missense mutations, on the network, on the whole, on the topology of the network. Uh, you can also predict these mutation agiotypes computationally if you know the three-dimensional structure of these proteins and protein-protein interactions. Right? You take the protein-protein interaction and you look at the structure and you. Say, Say, well, here's a mutation. Where is the mutation? Is it lying on the interface? Is it, is it buried in the core, exposed to the surface? You can do structure-based calculations of, of the free energy changes You know, uh, uh, when, when, you, when, you, uh, when you have this mutation. You can predict how it's going to affect the, uh, the binding constants of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the protein protein ratio. So you can actually predict these uh, computationally using structural systems biology as well. Uh, so a number of years ago, um, such experiment was actually done uh, on, on a genome scale uh, by uh, by uh, Nidhi Sani, primarily by Nidhi Sani and Song, and Song Yi experimentally uh, in Mark Waddell's lab, and uh, computationally, uh, Jasmine Kulim Huntington from my lab. So we analyzed uh, the, ex the, ex the experimental data, and this whole thing is a big collaboration uh, driven by uh, Mark, Mark Waddell. Uh, from Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Fritz Roth from the University of Toronto. Uh, so, what they, they were able to do experimentally is to perform this huge amount of ES2 hybrid screening, essentially to take a pair of proteins from human and then put in the mutation. Put in the mutation. You can put in any mutation you want, but here what they did is they put in the known. Uh, Disease, uh, no mutations which causes Mendelian diseases, so Mendelian disease causes mutations, and then compare those mutations to common mutations, mutations that, uh, that occur in healthy people, you know, uh, in everybody. So they have a collection of those two types of mutations. And then they are able to assess how are those mutations going to impact the entire human interactome. Um, so the basic idea here is that, so this is called the agiotype, the precise way that each mutation uh, disrupts the, the, interact, the entire interactome. And the idea is that using these agiotypes to give you a better understanding of the, the, uh, the phenotypic consequence of those mutations, right? So here we have the wild type, for example, here we have the wild type a protein and with wild type um, interaction, uh, 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 the um, interaction patterns, and then here we have the quasi-null mutation, which kills the whole protein and kills all the interactions associated.
associated with it. So it's going to have lead to a different, maybe you're going to get a, you know, sick disease, you know, it's going to be more deleterious versus these other mutations, which are agetic. They, you still have the whole protein uh, and it still carries out a large fraction of its function. It's just one specific function that has been uh, disrupted. One specific interaction has been disrupted. So maybe they're going to lead to a different kind of uh, disease manifestation. So that's the basic idea. And finally, you, you, you know, you have this uh, yet another mutation that leads to a gain of interaction, which perhaps will lead to a different phenotype, maybe cancer. You know, um, so it's a huge amount of work, uh, experimental work, and when everything is said and done, it turns out that um, there's a big difference between uh, the disease, the Mendelian disease causing mutations versus the common mutations that, that appear in healthy people. When you look at the health, when you look at the common mutations which appear in healthy populations, uh, these are non disease variants, almost all of them doesn't disrupt the intractome at all. You can see this very large, nine, more than 90% of them are the so-called quasi-wild type. Basically, they don't do anything to the intractome, okay? So they're just, so they're just a tiny percentage uh, that disrupts the intractome, but it's a very small percentage. On the other hand, when you look at the disease mutations, you can notice that more than half of Mendelian disease-causing mutations, they disrupt the intractome one way or another. Right, so this is a big contrast. In particular, when you look into the details of how they disrupt the interactome, you can see that half of them are the red ones. These are quasi now. These are a classical type that way. When, when, when we think about mutations, when, you know, you have a mutation, it kills the whole protein. The whole the whole protein is gone, right? But that only explains half of these the interactome disruption cases. The other half is the more subtle case, in which the mutation only doesn't kill the protein. The protein is still there. In fact, the protein is still largely functional. It's just the one specific interaction has been killed. So it's the more subtle type. And so this illustrates that we have to uh, really care about these type of very subtle agetic mutations. It turns out that these agetic mutations do make sense from a structural and biophysical perspective. So for example, it turns out that these agetic mutations that disrupts just one kills one specific interaction, they do tend to lie on the interface that mediates that interaction, which makes sense. I mean, that's how mutations kill interactions. They lie on the interface that mediates that interaction, thereby disrupt that interaction. And moreover, they, if, a, if a protein has two different interfaces, then the, these agetic mutations lie on the correct interface. It, it, it lies on the interface that mediates that specific interaction that's being disrupted by this agetic mutation. It doesn't lie on the wrong interface. So, you know, this is sort of like a sanity check to tell you that everything is um, you know, that it makes sense. Uh, the other thing is that these um, agetic uh, 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 perturbations, they're useful in terms of understanding disease. So in particular, here we have a protein that interacts with many other proteins. Now, if I have a mutation that disrupts just this protein, uh, protein interaction, the others are relevant, it turns out that this interaction partner that, that's been disrupted here, is actually uh, directly related to the disease that you're trying to, that, that, that this mutation is involved in, okay? So you need to know which interaction has been disrupted because that helps you actually uh, understand, make a connection between the mutation and the specific disease that is causing. Whereas these two other proteins, which interactions are not being disrupted, they're not related to the particular disease uh, phenotype. So here's a more uh, kind of a more dramatic uh, uh, showing of that. So here we have a, a, a gene, which is a hub protein, includes a hub protein, interacts with many other proteins in the human interactome. Now we have four mutations. You can see these four mutations, they have two different kinds of interaction perturbation patterns, two different kinds of agiotypes, so to speak. So the first three mutations, you can see one, two, three, they give you exactly the same, uh, uh, they kill exactly the same subset of protein-protein interactions, okay? So these three share the same uh, agiotype, so to speak, whereas the last mutation gives you a different interaction perturbation patterns. In fact, it doesn't disrupt the interaction at all. Right, the protein interaction at all. So in this case, it turns out that the first three mutations give you a different disease phenotype than the last mutation, which again makes sense. Why? Because they disrupt the interaction in different ways, and different interaction perturbation patterns will give you different disease disease phenotypes. So, so again, this is sort of a um, it's good news that uh, that this uh, this hypothesis really holds up. Okay. <clears throat> 
And the last thing I want to say about this is you can also do, so, you know, you can do experimental uh, measurements of these uh, 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 mutation perturbation uh, 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 patterns on the interactome network. You can also do, if you have the structural interaction network, you can also, if you have the structural model for these protein-protein interactions, you can just do direct calculations, you know, put in the mutation, calculate how it's going to impact the stability of that protein-protein interaction. And it turns out that, uh, that there's a broad agreements between these experimental measurements and the predictions based on uh, structural systems biology. So here uh, on the top are the structural based calculations. And at the bottom are the experimental measurements. As, as you can see, in, all of, in, in both uh, experiments and predictions and computational predictions, you can, you can, you can see that the neutral, uh, the common mutations, right, that appear in healthy populations, they do not disrupt the interactome, whereas the disease mutations, a large fraction of them, do disrupt the interactome. And, and roughly partition between the more dramatic disruption in the, in the case of uh, non quasi non mutations kill the whole protein versus the more subtle disruptions, the cases where the protein is still there, just a specific interaction that has been disrupted. Um, so this is work by uh, Mohammed Ghadi, who carried all the, all the computational work uh, from my lab. Uh, so I want to switch gears a little bit. So that's, so that's that's how we can use this approach to study the impact of genetic mutations on interactive network. But we can also use this approach to gain insights into uh, design principles of biological networks. So there are many such design principles. Uh, what do you mean by design principles? It's basically why do these networks look the way they, 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 they do and how is that related to their function, right? So that's kind of what I mean. And there are many aspects of this. I'm just going to show you this intriguing aspect, which I've particularly uh, very fond of lately, is the question is, why are these networks so complicated, right? So this is a picture I showed you before, the hairball, right? You got many proteins, they interact with uh, everybody else, and you got this hairball of the human protein interaction. So the question is, why are these networks so complex? Do they really have to be this complex, right? Um, so how do we, but what, what, what does it even mean by asking this question? So this reminds me of uh, this old, um, this old um, commercial, uh, probably, I don't, I, I can't remember who put up, probably by Mac. <laughs> so, so showing you this two person, right? So to the left is the PC, to the right is the Mac. I mean, the idea is that, you know, Mac is lean, even though it's complicated, but it's necessary. Whereas PC is complicated because it's bloated. It has all the bells and whistles attached to it. It's not really, not really necessary. So the question is, which one is the human interactome? Is it going to be to the left? Is it going to be to, to the right? We don't know, right? So, so, so I think it's an interesting question to ask. Do interactome networks resemble uh, the Mac? Or the other thing to, way to think about is a Swiss watch, right? It's, it's complicated, but it's necessary. Um, all pieces are useful. So this is this hypothesis is the so-called adaptive origin of complexity, right? It's complicated because it's necessary. Whereas the other uh, competing hypothesis is maybe it's just bloated, you know, like the Windows system. It's just, on, it's just all kinds of bells and whistles attached to it. And maybe it's just because it's easy to grow, just like the Windows software. It's easy to add features, you know, make it more complicated. But once you add all these features, it's hard to get rid of them. You know, it's hard to shrink back, right? So that's called a non-adaptive origin of complexity, uh, which just means that it's bloated, just like our everyday uh, software. Okay, um, so, so, so of course, this is a kind of interesting question, but it's hard to know how, where, where to begin to answer that question. But one way to address that question is, maybe we can look for, begin by look for um, uh, interactions uh, in the human interactome that we can simply delete without causing any harm, you know? So those are called dispensable interactions. Basically interactions that do exist in, in, in the human, in, in the human in, uh, interactome. There is a wire there, there's a connection, but I can just cut it and you won't feel any pain. So, so the question is, do such interactions exist? And if, if, if so, how much? So that, that, that's the kind of angle that uh, we wish to go in. So if we have lots of these kinds of you know, dispensable interactions, then, uh, then it's bloated. Then it's going to look like Windows PC. If we have a very small amount of them, then it's going to be 
more like a macro Swiss watch. Uh, now I should say that these, 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 these kinds of dispensable interactions, these are not false positives. They're not noise or false positives. They do, they're there, they're there, they exist. It's just, if you do the thought experiment of cutting them, cutting that wire, it has no negative consequence to the organismal fitness. You are not gonna be upset just because that wire has been cut. Um, and okay, so, and these dispensable interactions, they may actually carry out meaningful biochemical functions, right? But just in that specific instance, if I cut that wire, there's no negative consequence to the fitness of the cell and organism. So this is kind of the hypothetical experiment that we're thinking about, in particular driven by Muhammad Gadi, uh, a former PhD student with mine, is what you're gonna do is gonna take the whole human interact home, you know, there's a whole bunch of wires and then you imagine you, you systematically cut each one of those wires. And then you ask, can I cut here? Is it, is the, do you feel pain? Uh, you know, either the cell we're working in the feels pain, then this is a deleterious cut, or it, you, you don't feel pain, then it's a neutral cut, right? So the question is what fraction of these wires when you cut are neutral and hence dispensable, what fraction of them are when cut are, is going to be deleterious, it's, it's, it's going to be bad for the cell and the organism. So, so this is kind of a tough thing to answer. I mean, uh, we, we don't do any experiments, so we're gonna need a shortcut to answer this question indirectly through computational means. So the method we're, we're trying to answer this question is to, from the structural systems biology per, you know, uh, perspective. So we have the binary network, we have the human binary interactome network, right? So experimentalists have done a lot of hard work Determining, you know, here are the you know list of all the binary protein-protein interactions between the between the twenty thousand, you know, human proteins. So we're going to take the binary protein-protein interactional network. We're going to fill in the structural details by building the homology models for a subset of these protein-protein interactions. Okay, so now we have the atomic details for many of these protein-protein interactions, and then after that, we then we're going to map all these mutations, both uh, disease mutations and common mutations, onto the protein. And then use uh, the uh, molecular structure, three-dimensional structure to predict the agile type. How is that mutation going to disrupt the protein-protein interaction uh, network, right? Using exactly the same idea we, we said before. So, you know, here's a wild type uh, 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 protein, uh, protein interaction network. And here, if we have a mutation that lies on the surface of the protein, particularly on the uh, particular interface that mediates a specific interaction, then chances are that when we have the mutation, it's gonna disrupt that interface. Whereas if um, it lies on the surface, but outside of any interface, chances are that it's not going to disrupt any interaction. It'll be quasi-wild type. And if it lies in the core, and if it's a you know, drastic mutation, then likely the whole protein stability will be, will be disrupted. The whole protein will just be, be gone. And, you know, it'll be disrupted. So that'll be quasi not. So you can use a variety of structure-based methods to make such predictions. And that's what Muhammad uh, did. So once you have these predictions, then you can actually, they have very good agreements with experiments. So this is the plot, that, the pie chart, which I showed you before, which shows that, and this is uh, for both structure-based uh, predictions, which agrees with the uh, Needy Sunny's um, uh, experiments that for neutral, for common mutations, common mutations that appears in everybody, we, which we consider to be neutral, okay? Common mutations are probably harmless. Um, almost all of these mutations don't disrupt the interactome. Whereas for disease mutations, disease mutations, quasi, quasi Mendelian disease, which we believe to be deleterious, right? Deleterious, perhaps mildly deleterious, uh, or perhaps more seriously deleterious, a large fraction of them disrupt the interaction. So from, from these numbers, these pie charts, we know this probability, which is the probability for a neutral mutation being agetic, disrupting interactome. So that, that's essentially the fraction in the pie chart, as well as the probability for a deleterious mutation to be agetic. But what we really want, if we think very carefully, is the other conditional probability. We have to switch the two sides of the conditional prob uh, probability. What, what we really want is the probability for an uh, edge perturbing mutations to be neutral, because we want to know if that edge, if we cut that edge, is going to be neutral or not, right? So that's what we mean by, you know, how much of the interactions in the interactome are dispensable. So, what, so we need to sw swap the two sides of the condition probability. And there's an easy way of doing that. You apply the base rule, right? You swap the two sides of the condition probability. And of course, you're gonna have to need to know the prior probability of, let's say you have a spontaneous mutations in the genome. 
what is the prior prior probability that it's going to be neutral or, or mildly deleterious or severely detrimental, but you can, other people have done the study, you can get those numbers from the literature. And then you just plug into this equation and you get what you want. So this is just to show you how we do that. So we get all these numbers, prior probabilities for, uh, for, new, for mutation, for spontaneous new mutation to be neutral, mildly deleterious or strongly detrimental. So this is from the literature. Um, so roughly 30% neutral and 50% mildly deleterious and 20% strongly detrimental. And then we add in our pie charts, the two pie charts, which shows the conditional probabilities. And then we just, and then we use that to apply the base rule to swap the two sides of the conditional probability. So everything is said and done, we find that a, a minority, a minority of the human interactome are dispensable. Okay, so the majority actually, when you, if uh, with the more the majority of the edges, when you cut it, it's going to have a negative con uh, consequence in terms of uh, organismal phenotype. Okay, so what this means is is that the majority of the human interactome actually has a meaning. You know, sort of they're functional in in in, in the strictest sense. Okay. Um, uh, although there is a minority of, uh, there's a small fraction of the human interactome, which are dispensable, which means I can take those edges, I can cut it, and that's okay. That's actually fine. So it, it's a, it, it doesn't lead to any deleterious consequence to organismal fitness. Um, so that is kind of a, um, a sort of an interesting, uh, I would say, in, uh, interesting uh, application of this, of this approach, structural systems approach, which enables us to address a kind of a, um, an interesting question that, 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 that actually, you know, it's not that easy to tackle directly. So we, but, but we can use structural systems biology to, 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 to get an answer, to get an answer to that question. So um, I want to switch gears and talk about uh, a little bit of time and talk about the application of the structural systems biology approach to other kinds of perturbation, other kinds of um, uh, network perturbation um, uh, by pathogens. Of course, uh, this is, uh, 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 I guess, now becomes highly relevant given the current pandemic situation. So um, can we use this approach to study uh, pathogen host interactions from a, a systems, a structural systems biology perspective? So this is the work done uh, by a former uh, uh, a student of mine, Eric Franzosa, actually a while ago. Uh, so what he decided to do is to build um, not only build a three-dimensional view of uh, the within human, right, protein-protein uh, interaction network. So here we have each node here is a human protein. Each edge here is a uh, interaction between human protein, but he's also able to build. I mean, his idea was to uh, maybe to take, you know, uh, you know, look at all the perturbations, all the kind of different things that can perturb the human interactome, uh, pathogens, right? But at that time, the only pathogens that he can find that's well studied are viruses. <laughs> so he found a lot of viruses that people have studied. Um, so, and then he put the, the, these vir uh, vi uh, virus proteins into the network. So now we have two different kinds of nodes. So we have the human protein node and the viral protein node and two different kinds of edges, right? We have the so-called endogenous interactions, endogenous edges, interactions between two human proteins, and then the exogenous interactions, the interaction between the human protein and the viral protein. And he, he was able to build not only the binary network but also for each one of these nodes, he, he, he can build a molecular model for that human viral protein, as well as for each one of these edges, he can build a molecular model for that interaction, for that uh, uh, within human, as well as between human and viral uh, protein-protein interaction. So this is the map that he built. It's a tiny map. So this is the classical small data problem I was talking to John about. Uh, so because that, that was this, that was all the data he was able to gather at that time. Um, so each one of these um, uh, black, uh, each, each one of these red node, red dot is a viral protein. Each one of these uh, red edges is the interaction between virus, pro viral protein and the human protein. And then all the other edges are interactions between human Human, among human proteins. Okay, so this is essentially a combined within human and human uh, virus uh, structural interaction network. So we know we actually know the three dimensional structure for every single one of these nodes and edges. So this enables us to ask some pretty basic questions, uh, which were just not you, you, uh, able to do if all you have is the binary 
network. Okay, so here we have a situation of a human protein that binds to another human protein and also binds to a viral protein. So pretty basic question is, how exactly is this viral binding related to this human protein binding? You know, this red edge and this blue edge. You will have no idea if all you have is the binary network. All you know is they both bind to the third uh, human target protein. You don't know. Uh, the geometric relationship between those two edges, but with the three, with the structural information, you you can actually easily see whether or not, for example, these two binding interfaces, whether or not they have nothing to do with each other, or whether or not they overlap significantly with each other. So you can actually do that determination. And to make a long story short, here you can actually see this is what's, what 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 you find. That in, that in many cases, actually in in, in the yeah, more, much more frequent than you would expect by chance, you have a situation where the viral binding interface strongly overlaps with the human with the, with the human bind, so with the human binding interface. So the exogenous interface is colored in red and the uh, uh, endogenous interface colored in blue, they have significant overlap. So this is more much more significant than you would expect by chance. Why? Because the protein is a big object. It's a big object. It has a huge surface. If you just randomly put in, uh, uh, throw in another viral protein, another human protein to bind to this human protein, they're not going to interact. I mean, they're not going to overlap. The, the interface is not going to overlap. But you do, in practice, find a lot of strongly overlapping cases. Uh, that's much more frequent than you expect by chance. And whenever that happens, there's also a small tendency for the viral interface to be a little bit smaller than the corresponding human interface. So this underlies this notion of mimicry, right? So this mimic, but it's a specific type of mimicry. It's a mimicry of the interface. Is the, is the interface mimicry? So the virus is trying to mimic the human in terms of mimic binding interface in order to com in order to compete, hijack, and manipulate uh, existing endogenous interactions, as opposed to creating entirely new interaction surfaces uh, from scratch. And I guess you could you could rationalize that because you know viruses has tiny genomes, so they have very limited genomic resources. So if you can copy and paste, if you can hijack, it's much easier to do that. Uh, it's much harder to target from scratch, you know, like uh, from from uh, uh, to to create an entirely new ex exogenous interface from scratch. So that's kind of the argument. Um, so here are a few examples of the, these kinds of the interfacial mimicry phenomena. So on top, we have a human protein, a blue and a viral protein, red, they compete for binding to the same um, third target protein human at the same site using the same interface. So in this case, you can actually see that the, the, the mechanism, why do they compete? Well, how do they achieve? How does the viral protein achieve interface mimicry? Very easy. The viral protein looks almost exactly the same as the human protein that is trying to mimic. Right, essentially just copy and paste it, uh, the whole structure, the whole sequence and structure. So this is a case of interfacial mimicry by means of sequence and structural similarity. Uh, so this is one mechanism, but down here there's another mechanism, uh, there's another way in which the virus, here is a virus in red, and the human protein in blue, so the viral protein is trying to mimic the human protein, they, they do bind to the same inner site, the, the same interface of the third protein, but they look totally different from each other, right? So this is a case of uh, inter interface mimicry without, without sequence and structural similarity. So you can ask the question, how frequent do you find these two types of mechanisms? Um, so it turns out that in the case of virus mimicking human, most of these cases of interface mimicry are done without any sequence or structural similarity. Okay, and then if you compare how, but then within human, actually, there are many, many cases of human protein mimicking another human protein that compete for binding to the same third human protein at the same interface. So there's a lot of such interface mimicry within human as well. In those cases, vast majority of them are actually done by copy and pasting. They're done, uh, the, those interface mimicry are achieved through sequence and structural similarity within human. Okay, so what this means is there's already a lot of uh, evolutionary pressure for viruses to try to, re to reinvent, to, to really to come up with original novel solutions to this problem, to, to, to this challenge of trying to target the vast human 
in rat home using extremely limited uh, genomic resources. So that's kind of the, 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 the bottom line here. And it turns out that you can also uh, study, if, you know, like I said, the, the human interactome is vast, right? There are many, many protein protein interactions, there are many, many interfaces. Why does the virus only target this interface and not millions of other interfaces? So, is there anything special about the interfaces, the endogenous interfaces um, that the virus is trying to target and hijack and mimic? So you can do a lot of bioinformatics, data mining, uh, just basically look at all these interfaces that viruses like to target, and then compare with these other uh, within human endogenous interfaces and just simply ask, how are they any different? So Eric tried a whole lot of different things, but just to summarize, oh, actually, right. So it turns out that there is a, that, that they are special, that the um, endogenous interfaces that are uh, mimicked by viruses, they tend to, First of all, their function tend to involve regulatory activities. So there's a small enrichment for regulatory activities. They tend to involve transient binding. So basically, uh, transient binding, what I mean is the two proteins, sometimes they're, they bind, other times they don't. Okay, so they're not always binding. So that's called the permanent or obligate binding. So they, they tend to be transient binding and they tend to participate. So these interfaces tend to be hubs in the sense that they tend to mediate multiple endogenous interactions. So by targeting this, this, this uh, interface, you achieve multiple, I guess you achieve multiple goals. You, know, you, 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 uh, you can get a you know, bigger sort of uh, uh, impact. So all, all, you know, all this is to, to, to say that, that, that these interfaces that the viruses are targeting, they tend to be high level regulatory components of the cellular circuitry. Again, this kind of backs, backs up that notion that, um, you know, that you got to target where it matters and, um, and, and you, you, you have to pick and choose and you have to be, you know, sort of come up with novel solutions because you only have very small limited genomic material to work with. Um, so the last thing that uh, we did, Eric did, is to actually look at these um, uh, different binding interfaces, right? So here on the back, on the background, we have this big target human protein that that's been targeted by both um, uh, human proteins, other human proteins. So that's the blue is the endogenous interactions, endogenous interface, and as well as the red, that's the red part is the part that's targeted by the virus, the exogenous interface. So we know that there's overlap with each other significantly, right? So interface mimicry, so that's the purple part, is the mimic part, interface mimicry, viruses tend to mimic, they tend to hijack rather than create their entirely new uh, exogenous interfaces. Uh, but still, uh, the question is, if you look at these three um, uh, kind of parts, uh, three set of uh, residues, uh, do you see anything, is there anything in special or interesting about them, especially from uh, this evolutionary perspective? So what Eric did was to look at uh, the divergence in genomic sequences between human and mouse, okay? So basically what he found is this blue part, this endogenous interface is incredibly well conserved. Which makes sense because these are molecular, you know, machineries in the in the in the you know in human. You got a mutation there; it's probably bad, so you don't want any mutations there. So this is incredibly well conserved. Uh, but what's interesting is that this part, the red part, is much less conserved. Uh, but then, really, the least conserved is turned out to be the purple part, which is really interesting. So what that means is, is there seems to be this kind of evolution arms race going on where. Uh, the virus is trying to target the human protein and the human protein is trying to run away from the viral targeting by accumulating these mutations, right? So you got this accelerated pattern of accumulation of mutations, which then you see uh, here that there's a great amount of uh, sequence divergence uh, between human and mouse uh, for the, the greatest amount actually for the mimic residue. So this is a, this supports this idea of uh, evolution arms race between, between host and pathogen. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, so the other thing that's really interesting is that um, you can also take a look at, so it turns out that this whole notion of the viruses has very limited um, resources. So it's gonna have to be very economical in terms of how you want to bind to the host. It turns out that viruses has this ingenious solution to that. It uses the so-called, it hijacks the so-called linear motifs. These are short peptides in human, 
okay? And then, but somehow the viruses mimic it's, if you look at its genome, it highly contains these linear mo uh, motifs. So in the human, their endogenous function is to bind to the corresponding uh, uh, interaction partners in human and carry out a variety of functions, okay? So a very simple, uh, ingenious way that the viruses try to hijack this, these kinds of uh, uh, host uh, pathways is by essentially mimicking these uh, human motifs. So, you know, so for example, here we have the EBE virus, HIV virus. So you can see that these viral proteins are packed, are packed with um, uh, human-like motifs, okay? One protein has many, many human-like motifs. Basically, they, they, and then when you put them in the, in the human cell, they're gonna, you know, basically do do all the hijacking work, right? So this is a very ingenious way. That one way that viral, uh, viral protein try to be economical about how uh, how they're gonna target and disrupt the human interaction. Uh, so the other thing that you can do, so this is work by Frank Chan, is by kind of real, kind of uh, linking the different type of perturbation mechanisms. So we talk about the interactomes can be perturbed by either mutations, right? You have a mutation then it's going to disrupt the interactome. But you can also be, be perturbed by viruses. You know, these are different types of perturbations, if you want, right? So viruses perturb, you put in a virus, it perturbs the interactome, you put in the mutation, you perturb in the interactome. So the interesting question is, if you have a viral perturbation and mutational perturbation, if they perturb the same site of the interactome, do they give you the same consequence, even though it's a different type of pertur uh, perturbations? Right, and it turns out that the answer is yes. So it turns out that all that matters is which side of the interactome you're you are perturbing. If they're perturbing the same side, you're gonna get the same uh, phenotypes. It doesn't matter if it's a virus that's doing the uh, perturbing or if it's the mutation that's doing the perturbing. They have equivalent consequences. Right, so that's kind of an interesting, interesting um, uh, aspect of this. Okay, so I just want to summarize enough. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, um, we, we're doing a lot of this work um, trying to connect the, the um, um, structural biology modeling with uh, systems and network biology and then try to map different kinds of perturbations, mutation, pertur you know, uh, uh, genetic mutations and pathogenic perturbations and then try to study how these kind of small scale kind of uh, uh, perturbations at the atomic scale uh, uh, relate to the um, uh, sort of whole uh, cell and uh, organismal phenotypes. Um, so that's uh, what we're trying to do. And I hope to, to have convinced you that the, the, this is a useful approach. It's a useful approach. It gives you a lot of insights into both genetic diseases and infectious diseases, but also more fundamentally gives, you know, can, can provide some insights into understanding uh, network design principles, you know, why these networks are so, com so complicated, why do they look like they do, how do they relate to function, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I will stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much.